Hello. Hello, please. Yeah, what's the problem, sir? Um, we've just closed down our farm track. Yeah. So, and, uh, feed our pheasants. We've come across a Range Rover with three people in it. Yeah. It appears that they're dead. I don't know what's happening. Blood in the motor all over them. back to a new video on the Essex Boys case. As always, if you are enjoying the content, please do give the video a thumbs up. And if you're interested in the Essex Boys case, or simply true crime in general, don't forget to hit the subscribe button below. In September 1996, five months after their arrest, and exactly a year before the trial had begun, Michael Steele and Jack Wombs had appeared at Belmarsh Magistrates Court for a committal hearing. After a week of evidence, the trial was passed on to the Crown Court and the trio were told they had seven days to file notice of alibi. If they had witnesses or evidence that proved they could not be responsible for the murder, they had only a week to submit it. The rule is a simple extension of the caution given to anyone who is arrested, that while they have the right to remain silent, if they later in court rely on something that they have not previously mentioned, the jury can be made aware of this. In other words, if rather than explaining their actions or whereabouts straight away, they appear to have gone away and had a good think about the best possible excuse, then the jury has a right to know. For Steele and Wombs, their alibis had seemed straightforward enough, if slightly weakened by the fact that their only witnesses were relatives. What weakened them far more was the revelation that the pair had not submitted their alibis until July 1997, more than 10 months late, and just eight weeks before the start of the trial. Not only that, but under close scrutiny, Steele's shockproof, rockproof alibi quickly began to crumble. The till receipt didn't necessarily relate to the credit card slip. Anyone could have bought petrol at that garage at 5pm. It also transpired that Steele's former sister-in-law, Phyllis Stanbrook, whose evidence that he had been at home around the supposed time of the murders, did so much to support his version of events, had not been asked to give evidence or make a statement until a few months before the trial. She was clearly crucial, so why wasn't she contacted sooner? That question was intriguing enough on its own, but when Andrew Monday QC began to question her about how she could be so sure of the date she and her daughter visited Steele's house, her answer surprised everyone. That's the day the solicitor told me it was, she admitted. Let's say he spoke to you on March the 1st, said Monday. If I asked you on February the 28th on what date you went round to see Mr Steele, what would you have said? Mrs Stanbrook paused for a moment, then replied. I would have said I can't recall. When it came to Jack Wombs, his recollection of shouting through the letterbox of his uncle's home seemed equally flawed. While in the witness box, he repeatedly told in great detail how he had bent down, held the slot open with his hands, and shouted through the front door. Andrew Monday then showed Wombs and the jury pictures of the door in question. It had no letterbox. And as for the supposedly broken down Passat that Wombs had picked up for Darren Nichols, the court heard from a local car breaker who gave a very different version of events. The day after the murder, Wombs had driven the vehicle to the man's scrapyard and told him, do what you like with it, just so long as there's nothing that could come back to me. Rather than destroying it, the man checked the vehicle and found it still had some life left in it. He sold it on. Then there was the evidence of Billy Jasper. Soon after his arrest, police in Chelmsford had contacted Ivan Dibley with the news that a man in custody was confessing an involvement with the triple murder. By mid-January, Dibley and his team had already gathered a wealth of evidence against Michael Steele that pointed to him being the killer. Jasper's story was intriguing, but failed to fit in with much of the evidence gathered thus far. A quick check into Jasper's background provided an answer. He had a history of confessing to crimes that he had nothing to do with. A self-confessed drug addict who admitted he had spent £400 a day on heroin and crack cocaine, he clearly found it difficult to distinguish between fantasy and reality. He was such a Walter Mitty, we just couldn't take anything he said seriously, says Ivan Dibley. We looked into his claims, but there wasn't much substance. We told Chelmsford Police to continue the investigation and to let us know if anything came of it. Nothing ever did. 
That's only left the mystery of why. If Jasper was lying, the members of the East End gang he had fingered for the crime had done nothing to shut him up. Although he had named them during the original police interviews, Jasper refused to name any of his accomplices in court, claiming he was too scared of reprisals. But even when their names eventually came out in the open, Jesse Gale, who later died in a car crash in May 1998, and Mr D did not seem overly worried about being linked to the crime. In fact, dozens of villains all across the country were happy for people to think they might have been involved. In a world where double crosses and rip-offs are becoming increasingly common, the kudos of having wiped out three of the country's most dangerous men and having gotten away with it is undoubtedly the best protection of all. Just after midday, on Thursday the 15th of January, the jury of eight women and four men retired to consider its verdict. As Steele and Wombs waited anxiously in the cells below, the news came just before 4pm that they had failed to reach a verdict. The jury was sent to a hotel and told to return to the court the following day. The next day, it happened again and the jury were told to return to the court on Saturday to see if they could reach a verdict. By the middle of Saturday afternoon, it was clear that they would not, and their stay in the hotel would be extended yet again. In any criminal case, reading a jury is almost impossible. Some say the longer the deliberations go on, the more likely the verdict will be not guilty. Others say extended deliberations show that not all the members of the jury are in agreement and are attempting to convince one another of their version of the truth. But often, as was the case with the Rettenden trial, it is simply that the jury are going over every item of evidence before taking their vote. They asked for additional material, to see certain pictures, to read transcripts of certain interviews once more. On Tuesday, the 20th of January 1998, after five full days of deliberation, the jury returned its unanimous verdict. Guilty. Darren Nichols states, I think I got the phone call within 10 seconds of the verdict going out. All I could think was, yes, 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 it's all over, thank fuck for that. But it faded really quickly once I started to think about it properly. You wait and you wait and you wait for the end of the trial. But once it's over, you realise it's not really over at all. There was another trial coming up. I knew that Mick and Jack would put in an appeal straight away. It was a victory, knowing that the jury saw through their lies and believed me, but it was pretty hollow. Deep down, I was really pleased. Of course I was, but I couldn't show it. I actually felt really bad about the whole thing. There was a time when I really looked up to Mick. He was almost like a father figure to me, and I felt like I'd really let him down. It's so stupid, all this nonsense about the criminal code and all that. None of it makes any sense. But when you've been mixed in those circles for a while, it does start to get to you. Back in the court, Wombs and Steele glanced at each other for a moment, then both shrugged their shoulders, then looked back at the judge. There is no other sentence I can pass on you for these horrifying murders of which you have been convicted than that of life imprisonment. Mr Justice Hidden told the pair, there is little that can be said usefully about either of you at this stage. You two are responsible, in my view, for taking away the lives of these three victims in a summary way. You lured them to a quiet farm track and executed them. They had crossed your path and you showed them no mercy. There is about these killings a hard and ruthless edge which can only horrify and stagger the non-criminal mind. You are extremely dangerous men and you have not the slightest compunction for resorting to extreme violence when you thought it was necessary. Both men were told that they would serve a minimum of 15 years. You've been listening to Blogs 19, written by Tony Thompson. This book is available to purchase online at Amazon and other online book retailers. Many thanks for joining me for this video. Very shortly you'll be able to see some other videos from the channel, including the Essex Boys playlist, which has all of the videos concerning this case in one convenient folder. If you like this video, please do give it a thumbs up. If you're new to the channel, please consider subscribing. I look forward to seeing you all again in the next video. Take care. Cheers.